Some of you might have heard that the internet emerged in the middle of the Cold War. But do you know exactly what happened in this story? After all, how did the internet come about? And what exactly is the new Web3? Today I'm going to tell you this incredible story. We welcome to Infinity Stories. Hello guys, my name is Andre Beden and you are on the channel Infinity Swappers, a channel dedicated to studying the ICP blockchain. So if you want to learn more about ICP, its projects, even everything related, subscribe here and come be a part of our community. We are the Infinity Swappers. Well, our story begins when the United States drop two atomic bombs on Japan and the Soviet Union defeats Nazi Germany marking the end of the Second World War. With the end of the battles, the United States and the Soviet Union became the two new world powers and ended up opposing each other's policies and influence. The two countries ended up going to war with each other, and this kicked off the Cold War. It was called the Cold War because uh, the two countries didn't attack each other, but this was a very tense period because no country knew exactly what the other's levels of technological advancement was and how it could attack. So in 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite to reach space. The launch of this satellite caused a lot of fear in the United States because it gave the feeling that the Soviet Union already possessed the technology to fire nuclear missiles and destroy US cities. The United States had uh, several military bases spread across the country and each military base developed its own research. For example, one base specialized in studying nuclear weapons, another specialized in studies related to submarines, another participate in the studies that would later take men to the moon. Anyway, each military base uh, conducted its own studies. There was even a military base working with a project called MK Ultra which studied how to use drugs to control the power of the mind. I know, I know, this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it actually happened. At the time, the Soviet Union started talking about a new secret weapon, showing videos of Nina Kuladina, a woman who could move objects with just the power of her mind. This news scared the world, and it was published in several newspapers, like the Pittsburgh Press. Of course, the United States didn't know if it was true or false, but they also invested in experiments like MK Ultra to see if it would be possible to control objects with the power of the mind. And that was the context. The US government was investing a lot of money in research and each place, each military base, did a specific research. But it was a war, and the United States was afraid that if a military base was attacked, all that research and all that knowledge would be lost. So, with that in mind, in 1958, the United States Department of Defense launched DARPA. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA would be responsible of creating a new communication system that the Soviet Union could not attack. They discovered that it would be possible to connect computers with telephone lines and use telephone lines as a way to transmit data. So the idea was to connect several computers in the same network where everyone could share information with each other, so the data would be saved on several computers. So, 
if a military base was destroyed by a bomb, another military base could continue this that project, accessing the entire uh, database saved on the network because the information was no longer a, a physical place. The information would be on the net, on the entire net. And so, in 1969, the ARPANET was created. ARPANET was the first decentralized network of connected computers from the military, universities and other agencies of the US government. It was created to transmit secret data across the country. It started with four connected computers at four universities. And little by little, the network grew and more computers were connected. And on this map from 1977, we can see that the ARPANET was already a network with several connections, from the Pentagon to universities like Stanford, the University of California, and it was even connected with Hawaii. But there was still one big problem. ARPANET couldn't connect over long distances, and the US government wanted to connect with its military base installed in other regions around the world and also connect with allied countries. So they need to make the ARPANET able to communicate even over long distances. Thus, in 1974, a protocol was created called TCPIP, Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol, a protocol that could operate over long distances. This protocol was fundamental because it managed to make ARPANET network uh, in the United States able to connect with countries in Europe. And one place where the ARPANET was connected was in Switzerland, in the third laboratory. And here these stories start to get interesting. Let's talk about CERN, European Organization for Nuclear Research, an organization made up of more than 20 countries, which was created to study nuclear energy. CERN had a giant laboratory with many scientists working together. But the problem is many scientists were temporary. Uh, they received an invitation to help you with some project, uh, work for three months or six months, and then they return to your homes. Some came just to present their works or studies, and then they back to home. And that was bad because each scientist live in a different country. So Sir decided to use the ARPANET to connect the scientists and researchers around the world. But the problem is that using the ARPANET at that time was very complicated because the interface was confusing and it wasn't easy to navigate or publish texts. So many researchers or scientists didn't publish anything because they couldn't. And who worked there in the CERN at that time is Jim Berners-Lee, a physicist and computer scientist. One day, Jim Berners-Lee had the idea of creating an interface on the top of the TCP/IP protocol, which were the HTTP and WWW protocols, creating a new layer called Web. Creating this new layer uh, above the ARPANET, Jim Berners-Lee was to able uh, to create a visual interface for the internet, transforming that messy black screen with full of letters and numbers to a more beautiful and organized screen. And so, in November 1990, Jim Berners-Lee released the first web browser called the World Wide Web. It was a very simple browser, works in black and white, but it allowed students and scientists to publish their studies and researches in a much easier and more practical way, even offering the option to edit texts directly in the browser. The news of the new internet web spread in the universities, and students start creating a new browsers like Everwise and then Viola www. And here was born Web One, the web of reading, 
when sites were static, uh, they look like uh, like pages from books without any form of interactivity. But notice that there, at the beginning of the web one, the internet was used for academic reasons, for the publication of studies or scientific research. They imagined that the internet could be a great world encyclopedia with thousands of people sharing their texts and studies. So at the beginning of the web one, uh, if you weren't a student or a scientist, you probably find the internet a pretty boring. But over time, the internet has evolved and is no longer just a tool for scientific publications. And this is largely thanks to the creation of a new browser called Mosaic. Mosaic was a great visual revolution because it allowed organizing texts with different sizes and fonts, bold, italic and much more. With so much success, the creators of Mosaic decide to create a new browser. And then they create Netscape, a new browser much more easier to use. In addition, Netscape allowed the use of images, videos, animated GIFs. See, for example, this website for the game Monkey Island in 1996 that even had music. Netscape is considered that most important moment in Web1 because the Netscape allowed people to have a fun experience using the internet. This made the internet stop being seen as a nerd thing or just for universities and students and the internet began to be seen as a new form of entertainment for the whole family. Now you could visit Garfield's website or play online chess with your friends. But realize that on Web1, uh, most people were just spectators. They accessed the internet just to read and just to consume the content. Until the end of the 90s, the first messaging services like ICQ appeared, allowing people to talk to each other. Services like Blogger appeared, allowing people to create their own websites and blogs. We have Photolog, a kind of blog to share photos. And of course, social networks appeared, like Facebook. And here we arrive at Web2, a new phase of the internet, uh, the web of social networks and content production. Now users can create content, participate and interact virtually. So on Web2, we are no longer just viewers and became producers. And this was a big change because now people could create your websites, blogs, uh, publish content on Facebook, create videos on YouTube. We can comment, we can like, we can share, and we can do all these things for free. And that's the big problem of the Web2. Because, as the saying goes, if you are not paying, then you are the product. You understand, on Web2, we have access to many services and social networks for free. And all we have to do is register our data on the platform. And that's the problem. Uh, and many people don't realize the danger of this. These companies give you free access in exchange for your data because they sell your data. They use you to make money. The apps use technology to track your activities and manage your internet behavior. And then they take our data and sell to other companies for them advertise to us. We are used, that's crazy. So today in Web2, we don't have control over our data and we don't have privacy. And there's one more problem. We use the internet to publish our stuff and post our photos or videos on social media, but today 
today, nothing we produce on the internet is ours. We don't own anything. You post your photos on Instagram, but if tomorrow Instagram uh, decides to delete your account, you've lost all your photos and you have lost all of your followers. A good example of this was what happened with the Orkut, a old social network. I don't know if you knew, but uh, here in Brazil, the biggest social network ever, which uh, was most successful, wasn't Facebook. In Brazil, until 2010, everyone had an Orkut. And the problem was that, because Orkut was only successful in Brazil. And one day it was turned off, and all files and photos have been deleted. And then suddenly one day I lost all my photos and everything I had published on my profile on Orkut. And this is just an example of how today in Web2 nothing is really ours, all belongs to a companies and apps, and they do wherever they want. But all that is starting to change with the creation of blockchains like ICP. And here we arrive in the next phase of the internet, which is Web3, a new decentralized internet which will be built on the top of blockchain and smart contracts where we will really own our data and our own content. Certainly the first big step towards a new decentralized internet was the creation of Bitcoin, which brought with it a new technology called blockchain. Bitcoin Bitcoin solved the problem of decentralizing money and with Bitcoin, for the first time we are able to own something on the internet. Today we can own our money. And now the next step is decentralizing data and decentralized content and making people own their data and own their content. And this will be possible with blockchains such as ICP, Internet Computer Protocol. A lot of people still don't know, but ICP is one of the biggest revolutions on the internet. Because ICP is not just a blockchain inside the internet, ICP is the internet inside a blockchain. But that's a discussion for another video. So if you want to understand how ICP will change the internet in the coming years and help build a new decentralized Web3, don't miss our next videos. I will explain what ICP is, your purpose, what advantage are, and everything else you need to know. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. My name is Andre Beden and we are the Infinity Swappers.